My name is Alexander Rose. I'm the executive director here at the Long Now Foundation. I'm really happy to have Lewis back here. He's actually uh, one of the first speakers that we had here at Long Now. He's the one who got us in trouble with the fire marshal, actually. Um, and now we have to set a hard limit on the room. It was because of his first talk. Uh, his book, um, The Knowledge, which um, was a, a very synchronous book to, um, to us starting the interval here. Uh, before we started, I had written this blog post uh, called The Manual for Civilization about you know, what would you do if you wanted to write a manual for rebuilding civilization? And, and, uh, and after I wrote that, he contacted me um, based on um, some work he was doing with uh, reading J James Lovelock's original essay, I believe, right? Uh, that, was, that was around this topic. And so we kind of traded emails around this collection, which eventually became uh, our, our attempt to build about 3,000 books that would help you uh, preserve or restore civilization. And he went on to write the 300-page version, which in a way is kind of the index to this collection. It's a little window into every one of the subjects that we hope to have a, you know, a few books about. Uh, but it was, it was amazing, and we've been in touch ever since. And when I saw this book, The Origins, um, I, was, I was amazed at how different it was from the first one, uh, but at how even more uh, sweeping in time space than, uh, than his knowledge book. And if some of you were at the Marsha Bionarud uh, talk uh, around her book, Timefulness, um, written from a geologist's perspective, looking at this topic of how geology changed humanity, um, and then I think of kind of a very different perspective, looking at it uh, from outside the geology field, how geology affected uh, humanity is what Lewis is gonna speak on tonight. And thank you very much for coming. Uh, good evening, and thank you all very much for coming along tonight. Uh, my name's Lewis, as you heard. I'm a professor from the other side of the pond uh, in London at the University of Westminster. And the field of my research, the, 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 my day job, if you like, is in astrobiology and helping in the hunt for life on other planets. I, I get paid a salary to look for aliens, uh, specifically on Mars, and not just how could bacteria survive the environmental conditions on the surface of Mars, but more importantly, how we could find that they are there. How can you build an experiment to look for the signatures of life to strap on the front of a Mars rover and, and test handfuls of, of Martian dirt, which is something both NASA and the ESA, the European Space Agency, will be doing next year with two rovers, twin rovers that are being launched next year. That, that's my day job. And alongside that academic research, as you've heard, I, I take a lot of enjoyment about writing books. Uh, the last one that I was speaking, I think three, four years ago, almost to the day here in the interval, was on the knowledge, this, this conceit as to how we could write a manual for rebooting civilization as quickly as possible after someone has accidentally pushed the wrong red button on his White House desk and did in fact get Diet Coke but ordered up the, the nuclear arm again. How could you accelerate the progress through history as quickly as possible the second time round? What is the most important scientific knowledge that you hope would never get lost again in the dark ages? And the most important inventions and technology and tools that you would need to remake everything we have in the world around us? So hopefully, you, you, you're on the same side as me, you realize I'm not really talking about the end of the world. I'm not some kind of prepper or survivalist. I'm a scientist who's interested in the grand history of human civilization and how we built the modern world around us, all the stuff that we take for granted in our everyday lives. And what I've tried to do with this new book, with Origins, is pull out on that focus, on that zoom even further, and look at not just how human ingenuity and discoveries and inventions have built the world around us. But how the planet itself, the world that we live on, has had this determining, guiding influence on the whole of, of the human story. Right from our very beginnings, our, our very origins as a species. What was it about the environment in East Africa that crafted such an exquisitely adaptable and intelligent species of, of Homo sapiens. And then through the thousands of years of the history of the rise and fall of civilizations and empires and the building of the modern nations, how have 
different features of the planet, of plate tectonics, or the distribution of different natural resources, or the circulation of the atmosphere, directed that story even up to the, the modern day of current affairs and things you read about in the newspaper or watch on the breakfast news show, or how people vote, how is politics, even that has the, the planetary influence beneath it. So in this new book on Origins, I've tried to pull together all those different threads, combining planetary science and the grand course of human history. So look at those deep connections uh, underlying the world that we live in today and how we got here from, say, kind of five million years ago. And what I wanted to do tonight is pick out just a couple of those narratives. It turns out that trying to write a book on the whole of human history and also the history of the entire planet was quite a lot to bite off, and my editor tutted at me when I submitted the first draft. Uh, so for 45 minutes or so now, I just want to pull out uh, some of those interesting stories and explain those connections between features of our world and human history. I'm going to layer lots of maps on top of, of each other. And I think we should probably start uh, at the beginning, in the origins of us as a species. And this is our family tree on, on the left here. This is the hominin clay. This is not just homo sapiens at, at the bottom, uh, but all of the other human-like species, or the hominin species, reaching back to our original divergence from the chimpanzees about six or seven million years ago. And over that course of evolutionary history, we've been transformed from hairy, tree-swinging, ape-like creatures to naked, hairless, bipedal, upright walking, and then very efficient, upright running creatures. And we've also witnessed these huge jumps in cranial capacity, effectively our braininess, our intelligence for that entire hominin evolutionary tree. And alongside all of those changes to our bodies, we've also witnessed this story of the evolution of human technology, Stone Age tools, going from the very bottom here. This predates the origin of our species by about two million years. And you can almost, almost literally imagine some Homo erectus trudging his or her way across the plains of East Africa, stubbing their toe on this rock and going, ugh which is a very naughty Homo erectus swear word, <laughs> picking up that rock and then having that first glimmer of, of introspection, of realization, this thing which you can stub your toe on is actually also quite useful to bash things with. It, it, it's a tool. And then over time, we realized we could modify and adapt those to be even better at the jobs we wanted by chipping off flakes around the outside to make sharpened hand axes before we then realize that actually the chips that you flake off the core stone are even more useful. These are now very, very fine and light and incredibly sharp and pointy and can be used as the tips for projectile weapons, for spears and then arrows. And all of this human story, the, the evolution of our, of our species and our technological progression, the original Silicon Valley of these silicon tools was the East African Rift Valley. This is the cradle of humanity here. This is where we grew up as a species. This is, incidentally, where I also spent my own childhood growing up in Nairobi in Kenya. I went to a school called uh, the Banda, which is Swahili for mud hut. I went to the mud hut school in Nairobi and had many pleasant memories spending weekends and, and holidays in the savannah of, of this environment and, and taking safaris down into, into the Rift Valley. And so fundamentally what had to happen in this region of the world, where we were, our ancestors were, was you had to transform forest to, to change our tree-swinging ancestors into grassland, into savanna. And if we zoom out from this zoom in to look at our, our planet as a whole, if you just allow your eyes to swing across the midriff of the Earth, the equator, you'll realize that these Along the equator is where all of the rainforests of the planet are found. The Amazon, the rainforests of Central Africa, the Congo, and the forests smothering the archipelago of islands of, uh, of the East Indies. This is where, around the equator, the, the air gets very warm with the sunshine. It rises, it precipitates all that moisture to fall back as rain, and 
feeds, waters these huge rainforests. The equator is rainforest, all apart from this weird, dry little corner of East Africa, where we were. What dried out the region we were living in? And to answer that question, we need to peel off the satellite map of East Africa and look at the terrain, the topography of the land that was changing beneath our feet over the last five billion years. Sorry, the last five million years. There's been a magma plume rising up from deep in Earth's interior and pushing up into the underside of the continental plate of Africa. It is literally swollen up a zit on the face of the planet, which is the Ethiopian highlands. You can see an angry red spot in the middle of the picture there. And that has also caused the skin, the crust of our planet, to fracture, to tear and rip open. And this very distinctive Y-shaped pattern of uh, the Red Sea running up here, the Gulf of Aden, and then the third arm of this characteristic Y-shape fracturing of the crust is the East African Rift Valley. It's, it's this tunnel, this fracture in the crust. And that's in, in that tube, in that tunnel, where we evolved. And so the rising of the land is what dried out East Africa, turned the forest in, into grassland, into savanna. But what's been puzzling paleontologists for many, many years is what was it specifically about that fracture in the earth that drove our evolution to become so intelligent? What is the environmental question to which evolving intelligence is the answer. And what's been emerging in recent years is that there is this unique interplay of factors. There is the terrain of the East African Rift Valley, where you have a hot, low-lying valley floor with towering mountainous ridges on either side. But any water that does fall in this area is collected by those valley walls and funneled down into the Rift Valley floor, where it evaporates again very quickly. That distinctive terrain and landscape is interacting with cosmic cycles, wobbles in Earth's tilt and orbit around the sun, and so-called Milankovitch cycles. And those two planetary features have interacted to create this string of lakes along the valley floor, which are intensely sensitive to even tiny fluctuations in the raininess of, of this region. During periods of, of climactic instability, these lakes have been flickering in and out of existence, like a loose light bulb flickering on and off. And every time these lakes appear and disappear, it greatly changes the availability of water in the Rift Valley, the amount of vegetation, the abundance of animals which we could hunt. It was that chaos, that unpredictability, that forced us to evolve intelligence to be able to outthink our environment, to be able to survive. It was plate tectonics and cosmic cycles that granted us as a species this, in, this incredible versatility in behavior and intelligence. But although we, we grew up in East Africa, we didn't remain here. We migrated and dispersed out of our cradle and came to inherit the entire world. Homo sapiens is today the most widely dispersed animal species on the planet. And it was a different period of our planet's history that enabled us to make that great migration, to inherit the, the, the great continents of the Earth. This is what the planet looks like today. This is the, the map you would recognize instantly on the wall of, of any geography schoolroom. But the world 70,000 years ago when we were migrating out of Africa did not look like this. It looked completely different. This is how the world looked back then. We were right in the depths of this last great ice age. This is only the most recent ice age in a sequence of 40 or 50 ice ages over the last five or six million years. The world has been an uncharacteristically chilly period of its history. And during each of these ice ages, these huge glaciers and ice sheets grew mostly on the northern hemisphere and drew so much water out of the oceans that the sea levels dropped by over 100 meters. 
conflict. They exposed the seafloor. They opened up these land bridges between the continents. The Sunda land bridge in what is today the archipelago of East Southeast Asia, the Sahul, sorry, the Sunda land bridge and then the Sahul land bridge to Australia. But most importantly, for the human story, most importantly for this part of the world, was the Bering land bridge that opened up between Eurasia and the Americas. Our ancestors could simply walk without getting their, we their feet wet around the world to colonize and inhabit all of the corners of the planet. And around 25, 20,000 years ago, making their way into North America and then across the Panama Isthmus and down into South America. And as we were dispersing around the world, we encountered some of our cousin species, hominin species from that evolutionary tree we saw on the first slide that had migrated out of Africa before us and we then encountered as we were wandering across the, the plains of the Earth later. You probably heard of the Neanderthals. And we didn't just encounter these cousin species, we got quite friendly <laughs> with them as well. We interbred with them. People out of Africa have something like uh, between 1% and 2% of Neanderthal DNA in their genome, in your own DNA. We also encountered and interbred with an entire species of humanity, the Denisovans, that is only known to us by a few tiny fragments of finger bone. An entire species of humanity remains today only in a few tiny shards of finger bone, which we've been able to extract out DNA from, sequence it, and recognize its signature in our own genome. We migrated around the world, mated with other human species we encountered, and then took on board, almost like a cargo, their DNA, which we then carried with us as we dispersed. But as we walked into the Americas, we were the first human species ever to make it across into the Americas. We were walking where no human species had ever trodden before. And with the ending of the last ice age and the rising of the water levels again, these two great land masses became severed and separated from each other. And we began this great experimental history, two independent experiments in civilization in the, in the Eurasia and the Americas. Peoples that had the same intelligence, were genetically basically identical. We had access to wild animal and plant species. We could try domesticating, trying our hand at agriculture. And it was about 15, 20,000 years later when some European descendants of those original migrants took the shortcut to the Americas, which would cross the Atlantic. And there was then the, the collision of these two cultures, of these two civilizations again. The first civilizations to rise as we dispersed around the world um, happened very, very quickly after the ending of that last ice age. That, that, that interglacial period was the first time that we as a species had encountered an interglacial, the period between ice ages, when we were not in Africa. We were elsewhere around the world. And our answer to that climactic change was to invent agriculture. We domesticated plant species to feed ourselves. We settled down into increasingly dense populations until cities emerged, and then civilization grew out of that. And the first civilization to rise in Eurasia did so here, in the, in the Arabian Peninsula. We've talked already about uh, the opening up of the great East African Rift Valley and the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden here. That fracturing of the crust effectively ripped off a corner of Africa to become the Arabian Peninsula. But then as the Red Sea continued to expand as a newly formed ocean, that entire chunk of crust has been swinging outwards, like a, like a barn door caught in the wind, and has slammed into the underside of Eurasia. And when continents slam into each other, you crumple up great mountain ranges, the Alps, the Himalayas. In this case, the Zagros mountain range. And running perfectly parallel along the feet of the Zagros mountains is Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization. And what's going on here, in terms of the, the tectonic processes, is that whenever you have a newly formed mountain range, like the Zagros, just the sheer bulk of all of that rock sits heavy 
on the cross of the planet, and it sags downwards. You get a tectonic trough running alongside a mountain, what a geologist would call a, a, a foreland basin. And these twin rivers of the Tigris and Euphrates flow down that tectonic trough. This kind of makes sense, right? Rivers flow downhill. Thanks, Lewis. Thanks, mate. But because these rivers are flowing down from very fresh, young mountain ranges, the sediment they have eroded out and then deposit further downstream is incredibly rich, nutrient rich. It gives a very silty, alluvial soil, which is fantastically fertile for growing crops in, when you're still trying to work out agriculture in the first place. And the Mesopotamia, the, the land between the rivers, very soon became the land of cities, of Uruk, Eridu, and later Babylon. It is this tectonic process, this crumpling of the land from the continental collision that simply created the ideal conditions under which early agriculture could yield the first cities and the first civilization here in Mesopotamia. Not only did plate tectonics create as a species, it gifted us civilization as well. And while this was happening in this part of the world, leading up to around 3000 BC, on the other side of the planet, around um, uh, India, in exactly the same tectonic setting, the foreland basin sagging down in the feet of the Himalayan mountain chain, the Indus Valley civilization emerged. Different part of the world, same timing in history, identical tectonic setting. This is a general theme of the early civilizations to have merged. Now, civilization spread out of Mesopotamia and soon enough reached to the Mediterranean, to this oval-shaped inland sea. And perhaps the Mediterranean and, and the cultures and societies and civilizations and empires that have bubbled and fizzed around here are familiar to many of us from history lessons, from watching documentaries on TV. We, we know of the Mycenaeans, the Phoenicians, the Etruscans, the Romans, and the ancient Greeks. These are cultures that all seem familiar to us. But when you think about it, all of these civilizations, from the beginnings of the Bronze Age, through classical era, through antiquity, almost without exception, they fizzed and, and buzzed along the northern half of the Mediterranean Sea. Whereas the southern half, the northern coastline, has been historically very quiet. Apart from ancient Egypt, this tiny sliver of a civilization huddled along the linear oasis of the River Nile, and Carthage is the other main exception that exists just on that tiny peninsula there and came to challenge even the might of the Romans before they were crushed and absolutely obliterated. They were literally rubbed off the surface of the earth. By the, by the Roman armies. All of that activity of history has been on the northern half, not the southern half. There is this grand theme or trend that's continued for hundreds and thousands of years of history, which doesn't make much sense until we look at where the Mediterranean itself has come from. Where was the Mediterranean born? And it turns out the Mediterranean that we know of today is no more than this tiny puddle, a remnant of a once vast ocean, than its hey heyday was bigger or as big as the Atlantic Ocean. This is the Tethys, the Tethys Ocean. And if we wind back the history of our own planet to almost quarter of a billion years ago, this is the map of how our world looked 240 million years ago. Back then, if we rewind this videotape of our planet's history and the continents scudding around across the surface, in this period of history, they'd all collided together and fused into a single giant landmass, a supercontinent called Pangaea, the all land. And held just in the, in the cup of that C-shaped supercontinent was the Tethys Ocean, which over time grew and expanded, as the Atlantic is, is doing right now, until Pangaea ripped itself, tore itself apart again. And Africa and then India rode back north to recollide, to back end in this kind of pile up on the motorway of, of Earth's continents, closing up the Tethys as they went, destroying 
that ancient ocean, swallowing it back down into the interior of the planet. It's about 15 million years ago, this great ocean of the Tethys now exists as no more than a narrow seaway until it was closed off at both ends and now exists as no more than the puddle of the Atlantic. And it's that fact, the history of, of the Tethys and the Mediterranean, that explains that grand theme through our human history. That because it is Africa that is riding north and colliding into Eurasia, it's crumpled up all that northern coastline into the Alps, Carpathians, the Caucasians. This is a crumpled, rippled landscape. And with the rising of the sea levels since the end of the last ice age, it has now become a drowned, submerged landscape. The northern Mediterranean is absolutely riddled with natural inlets and coves and bays and therefore natural harbors. It is perfectly set up, perfectly conducive for seafaring societies, for trading and communicating with each other by ships. Whereas the southern half of the Mediterranean, the African coastline, is flat and straight and boring. It has no natural harbors. <laughs> Apart from Carthage, uh, wrong button, Lewis. Idiot. Uh, apart from Carthage uh, here, which as you can see is actually just on the lip of effectively a, a subterranean mountain, a submarine mountain range linking the toe of Italy. That's about the only place you can find a natural harbour in a thousand miles of coastline around here. And so it's that that explains this great disparity for thousands of years of human history. It is bestowed, it is created by the history of the Mediterranean and these planetary forces. Now, I wanted to fast forward in the talk to, to a slightly later chapter of human history and, coincidentally, a slightly later chapter of the book, which I'm trying to flog to you tonight, um, which is looking at how, in the beginnings of the age of sail, the age of discovery, when Europe first started looking out into the wider world and then came to discover it and, and, and push out, and how that was controlled and dictated by the pattern of winds around the world, but the atmospheric dynamics and this global wind machine. And this map here might seem slightly confusing at first when you look at it, because I'm, I'm trying to show in this map not the landscape of the continents, but the geography of the seas itself. So uh, here we've got the bulge of northwest Africa. This is Europe up here. This is the Iberian Peninsula with what was to become Portugal and then Spain here. And in this period of history, in the early 1400s, Europe was a primitive, backwards, uncivilized place. We were right on the western extremity of this broad, sprawling continent of Eurasia. We were right on the ends, the terminus, of the great trade work networks that spread across the continent of the Silk Roads, transporting not just silken and luxury goods, but ideas, cultures, religions, philosophies, technologies spread along the Silk Road. And we were the last in Europe to get them. China had blast furnaces for making iron and steel a thousand years before they arrived, eventually diffused and percolated to Europe. And when Europe first started trying to look out into the wider world, we couldn't head east, we couldn't backtrack along those overland routes, the Silk Roads that we knew about, because that period in history, there was a very powerful Islamic empire blocking us towards the east. We had to turn our heads in the opposite direction, towards the west and out into this vast, scary, tempestuous expanse of the Atlantic Ocean. An, an ocean that people with their right minds had just avoided going anywhere near with your ships. We crisscrossed back and forth across this puddle of the Mediterranean. We coasted a bit down the North African coast, but we stayed well clear of the depths of the Atlantic. And the stepping stones, if you like, that first started drawing European navigators out, first the Portuguese, and then the Spanish, and then the Brits, Dutch, French, everyone was piling in sooner or later, but the first steps were made by the Portuguese being pulled out into these stepping stones of the Atlantic archipelagos. And this map makes clear that those archipelagos, those islands, are no more than the very tips of huge submarine volcanoes. The, 
Azores up here are the volcanoes that make up the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. There's this great rent in Earth's crust of the Atlantic is opening up. And the Portuguese first started heading down the North African coast, following the direction the winds and the ocean currents were already blowing. And then they hit a fundamental problem. If you're used to coasting, heading down along the, the familiar safety of the coast and using landmarks to navigate by, how do you get back home? You can't just turn your ship around and head back up the way you came, because you'd be fighting against the very winds and ocean currents that took you there in the first place. And the realization, something that must have seemed completely counterintuitive at the time, is that the way to get back home is to turn away from the safety of the land, of the coast, and head deeper out into the Atlantic to complete what's known as a volta do mar, a return of the sea. Head out deeper into the ocean until you pick up a different set of winds and ocean currents. And when they headed further down the African coast and then completed a wider Volta de Mar to head back, they discovered the Azores. These islands were completely uninhabited by humans before this point. And what the Portuguese were doing in these very first tentative steps out into the deep ocean were piecing together these jigsaw pieces of the global picture, the global pattern of where the winds blow and the structure the predictable patterns about where the wind bands are and the ocean currents they blow around. And we've completed that picture now over the, over the uh, subsequent hundreds of years since then to map out how the atmosphere, the air high above our heads, churns around the planet to create these winds that we used to trade by. And, and again, this makes kind of common sense. This is intuitive to a certain extent. Around the equator, where it's very sunny, the warm, the, air, the warm air rises, dumps all the rain, that's why we find the rainforest there, circulates round through a very high altitude before descending back towards the surface at around 30 degrees north and south. That dry descending air creates all of the deserts around the planet. And then to complete that great vertical circulation current, the atmosphere has to return to the equator back along the ground. And that's just what we call the winds. And the only other fact that's important is that the planet is turning beneath its own atmosphere as we have these great circulation currents. It creates a Coriolis effect that deflects those winds to one side. So either side of the equator, we have these wide bands of winds that always blow to the west, the trade winds. In the next atmospheric circulation current, it creates winds that blow in the opposite direction, the westerlies. There are these conveyor belts wrapped around the planet that give you prevailing winds in opposite directions. If you want to navigate across an ocean between continents to trade and then come back again, once you've worked out this trick, it's a simple method of hopping back and forth between these different conveyor belts to take you back and forth the way you want to go. And we apply the understanding, that global picture of how our atmosphere works to build some of the longest range trade routes of history, which came to determine the early stages of globalization and the building of the modern world that we live in today. The Portuguese completed their dream of heading south, finding the bottom tip of, of Africa, reaching the Indian Ocean, and then the riches of the Spice Islands, which, which they came to monopolize. They found their way of literally circumnavigating, sailing around the Islamic empire up here to dominate that spice trade themselves. And if you want to sail around the southern tip of Africa, the only way you can do that, with the way that winds blow, is to steer such a wide loop through the ocean that you basically stumble across Brazil. The reason Brazil speaks Portuguese, whereas the whole rest of South America speaks Spanish, is that's just the way the wind blows if you're trying to get around Africa. Uh, the Spanish, first with Columbus, crossed the Atlantic, stumbled inconvenience. This continent had no right to be there. Uh, they cut across uh, that new continent and became the first eyes, first European eyes, to see this whole new ocean, the peaceful ocean, the Pacific. And the Spanish then established the longest range trade route of the Age of Sail, which is the Spanish Manila Galleon route. And they picked up all their trade goods from China, 
sailed north to around the coastline of Japan so they could pick up the band of westerly winds that bore them the entire breadth of Pacific to North America, where they could then coast down to their silver mines in Mexico, because at this time China valued silver even more than it valued gold, loaded up their ships with, with that precious metal, and then allowed the trade winds to blow them all the way back again. The reason that California, the reason that where we are right now, and cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles and San Diego were founded in the first place is to resupply those Spanish galleons because the only place you can get to on the North African coast after crossing the Pacific is here. It's just the way the winds blow around the planet. The Portuguese discovered a shortcut across the Indian Ocean to then oust the Portuguese and dominate the spice trade themselves um, by exploiting the band of winds known as the Roaring Forties. The westerly winds in the southern hemisphere don't encounter any big continents. Most of the continents are in the northern half of the world. There are no mountain ranges, there are no walls to block those winds, and they get stronger and stronger and stronger. The Roaring Forties are a literal highway in the ocean. You can shave off weeks of the crossing time. Uh, Australia was discovered by Dutch on this, Dutch captains on this Brower route, the shortcut, shortcut across the Indian Ocean. The problem with using that highway in the ocean is you need to know when to take your turn off from that highway, from that freeway. If you miss your turn off, you plow into Australia. You wouldn't believe the number of times captains have accidentally driven into, <laughs> straight into the side of a continent. The, the coastline, the coral reefs on the west side of Australia are absolutely littered with shipwrecks where captains had missed their turn off from the Roaring Forties, from that highway in the sea. The reason that South Africa became so important and speaks Afrikaans is that's where you need to launch your ships from to cross the Indian Ocean. That's why the Dutch cared about the southern tip of Africa so much. But arguably, the most important trade route for the subsequent playing out of history was the North Atlantic Trade Triangle. This was established at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution when Britain and North Europe had worked out how to get machines to make things. Nothing to rely on craftspeople, but very, very cheaply, very, very quickly manufacturing things with machinery. And those manufactured products, textiles, weapons, were sailed down the old Portuguese route to the North African coast, sold there, and then the ship's holds were filled with slave labor. People were kidnapped from their homelands, bundled in chains into the holds of these ships, taken across that trade winds band to the colonies of North Africa, but also South, uh, North America, but also South America, and then forced to work on the plantations, growing raw plant materials, tea, coffee, sugar, cotton. And those raw materials were then taken along the westerly band of winds back to, to North Europe, where they were converted by using our machinery into the textiles and the cloths, which we could then trade back down to North Africa, and so on and so on. The North Atlantic Trade Triangle was an economic cog sat across the ocean, being blown round and round by that global wind machine, and generating huge profits for its masters, for its slave masters. And all of this story, of these building, of these vast trade routes, are dictated by where the wind blows. These wind bands specify where you put your trade routes, and therefore where you need your ports, where you put your fortresses. The entire pattern of European expansion and colonialism and empire building, and the beginnings of globalization that made the modern world, was dictated by the atmospheric dynamics in and, and the, and these wind bands. The last story I wanted to tell you is all about how you can see even the fingerprint of the planetary in politics, in, in the way that people choose to vote has a planetary influence behind it. And the example I wanted to give you of this um, is from the United States, from the southern states of America. And again, if I strip off the satellite map and instead show you the political map, this is how people voted in the last presidential election. This, this is what put Trump next to the big red button. And Unsurprisingly to you guys, maybe more so in the UK, the southern states are on the whole a Republican area. It's a sea of red in this political map. 
Some counties did, however, vote for Democrats. But the Democrat voting counties are not spread randomly. They're not scattered across the southern states. There is structure. There's a pattern to where people chose to vote for Democrats. Up and down the banks of the Mississippi here, but more curiously, along this great arc, this crescent of Democrat voting counties through the southern states. That doesn't correspond with anything on the ground, anything in the actual landscape. These are the Appalachian mountains here. These were crumbled up by the last cycle of continent building. That's what created North America as a continent. And that Democrat crescent doesn't correspond to anything on the terrain, on the landscape. And if we peel off the landscape map, and now I show you a geological map, the dark regions here are rocks beneath your feet that are 75 to 80 million years old. And if I now layer on top again the political map, you'll see, there, you'll see there's a striking correspondence between people choosing to vote Democrat and having rocks beneath their feet which are 80 million years old. This makes no sense at all. People aren't, they're not going to their backyards, drilling boreholes and going, ah, it's 50 million years old rocks. I wanted to vote for Hillary, but now I've got to vote for Trump. So there's not a direct link, clearly, between the geology and, the, and people's votes. But there is this wonderful chain of cause and effect through hundreds of years of human history and then millions of years of our planet's history. And what was happening on the planet 75 to 80 million years ago in a chapter of Earth's history called the Cretaceous is the sea levels were much, much higher back then. The ocean lapped right up through the middle of North America in a great interior sea and laid down what was essentially thick deposits of seafloor mud, which became compacted down, buried by more recent strata of rocks, and then eroded away again and exposed along this particular arc in the southern states. To the north, the rocks are older. To the south, they're younger. These are the Cretaceous age rocks. And when that rock erodes to create soil, it gives you a very rich, fertile, dark soil. And it's realized in the early 1800s that that soil is phenomenally productive at growing cash crops like cotton, which, as we've already mentioned, unfortunately, in this period of history, meant slave labor. Cotton is incredibly finicky to harvest. It's not like cotton or rice. We can simply chop it off at the stalk, take it out of your field, and then shake a bit to get the grain that you want. Cotton requires fingers. And even today, after hundreds of years of after the Civil War and emancipation and freedom from slavery and the civil rights movement, even today is that Cretaceous band of rocks that has the highest density of black African Americans living there today. People that unfortunately still suffer, still are blighted with social economic problems of poor wages, poor health care, poor social structures, people that are therefore more likely to vote for Democrat election promises rather than Republican. And in fact, the city I've marked here, Montgomery, is where in 1955 Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white gentleman on the bus, the very epicenter of the entire civil rights movement that, that transformed society and politics of the whole of the United States began smack in the middle of rocks that are 80 million years old on the surface. And just to demonstrate that I'm not cherry picking the only example on the earth where you do have such a close correspondence between the geological and, and the human and the political, this is an example from my own home island, Britain. Uh, on the left here, this is the distribution of constituencies voting for Labour, which is the main left liberal political party in, in the UK. Uh, in the last general election, but pretty much any election you care to check. And on the right, in red, is the distribution of rocks beneath your feet that are about 320 million years old. And again, there is an astonishing, astonishingly cl close correspondence between those two maps. Now, I'll give you a hint as to what is behind this. The chapter in Earth's history 320 million years ago was the Carboniferous. These are the coal deposits. Something broke down on planet Earth 320 years ago and broke the planet's recycling system. Trees grow, grew back then very, very vigorously, fell over, died, 
and wood just not rot. For millions of years, trees grew but would not rot and built up these vast strata of what was effectively fossilised sunshine, subterranean forests, that first in Britain and then Europe and the rest of the world, we realised we could mine to throw in our furnaces to power ourselves through the Industrial Revolution. And even today, coal makes up a huge fraction of our energy use. And the last step on that chain of cause and effect in this particular correspondence uh, is that the Labour political party grew up out of uh, labour unions, coal mining unions um, in the UK. Now, those are the, the stories I've had, I've had time to talk about uh, tonight. Like I said, I've just picked out a couple of the threads from Origins, from the book, that I felt I was most um, surprised by when I was researching for this book. I put out some other uh, stories from the book. This is basically the clickbait from Origins. And it's everything from uh, why do most of us eat a bowl of cereal or a slice of toast for breakfast? How does the planet's history determine even what we eat for breakfast? Uh, why is it that Holland and its drowned landscape since the last ice age create the modern financial system? Why does capitalism come out of, of Holland rather than anywhere else? Um, why does the Great Wall of China follow an ecological contour along the planet? Um, we do have some time for questions now. Oh, the, the, there's books available. Did I mention? <laughs> um, I have left my fair isles and put myself on the road for, for most of this month to try to flog books uh, to you. Uh, Origins is here. If you want to go on the interweb, you can buy a copy of The Knowledge, which is my last book we mentioned, was how to reboot civilization after an apocalypse. Maybe buy that in the next couple of months, just to be, just to be safe. I think we were going to do a bit of a... Oh, yeah, rapturous applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lewis. I think um, what's really interesting in having uh, Marshall's talk so recently um, that there's kind of so much of the same conclusions coming from such a different perspective, and I, I super appreciate it. But not um, in a repetitive, same no, kind no, of way. No, no, no. <laughs> completely different style, completely different uh, type of examples. But I think it, like, what's interesting about it is how much it kind of proves, uh, proves the point. And I, I think it's curious that these books came out in the same year. Yeah. It's kind of stunning uh, in a way. Um, but we'll, uh, before we get to all the questions, I wanted to uh, answer the question that I, that I know we're all thinking is, why, do, why were you growing up in the Rift Valley? Ah, so in terms of these chains of cause and effect, the proximate cause uh, was my dad got sent out there. He was a, a, an engineer for British Airways. Um, he, I used to tease him when, before he retired uh, that he would <laughs> basically pump up the tires and fill them up with petrol, and he was just a glorified car mechanic, which to a certain extent was true until a jumbo jet would land and its you know, engine would fall off, and then it would be like an 18-hour certain like mechanical surgical procedure of putting this entire turbojet, turbofan engine back onto the wing of an aircraft and you know, connect up with hydraulics and the fuel so it doesn't fail at 35,000 feet. Uh, so I was almost born in... Saudi Arabia, when dad was post there, spent my toddler years in Dubai and was out to school in, in Nairobi. The publishers were really trying to push hard on that kind of make more of new publicity that you grew up in Nairobi and you have this yearning for your entire life to understand not only your own origins, but the origins of your species. <laughs> I mean, you know, I could, but people see through that kind of that bullshit quite quickly, right? Yeah, just tell them. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm super curious, uh, I think, about how your study of astrobiology kind of informs this book. I mean, are you, are you looking at the geology of Mars and uh, the moons of Jupiter and Saturn for their geology to figure where you, you know, where is the rift valley of Mars? Is that, a, is that kind of a way that you look at life in a way? In a sense, but Mars has no rift valley at all. Mars has no evidence for, for plate tectonics. Um, it does have a, the Valles Marineris, a huge, uh, kind of fraction of the crust, but it's kind of a different process going on there. Um, and although geologists, not me, I'm, I'm actually a biologist, I've been faking a lot of this uh, earth science here. Um, people who study Mars try to understand Mars' history by the geological signs we can see on the surface today, and therefore where is the best place to land our rover to look for, for signs of life. But actually, I think what I kind of brought to Origins wasn't so much that kind of astrobiology angle, 
but just coming at this big history topic as an interdisciplinary scientist, be being kind of comfortable, out more, kind of willing to go out of my comfort zone and teach myself a lot of earth science and planetary science and astrophysics and sort of things I talk about and try to fuse them all together to look and find these grand themes and, and trends in history um, for the book. So it, it was less about finding aliens for, for this one. Uh, Life in the Universe was, was my book I wrote. And, and in fact, that one called Aliens. Those are the books about aliens. Uh, <laughs> it literally says what it does what it says on the tin. Um, no, th this was... Origins was the book that's taken me far longest to research and write out of, out of all my books I've written, because it's that much further from my kind of home discipline, if you like. I mean, and not just origins of species uh, or potential species on other planets, but what about extinctions? Is that like reasons for extinctions? And I mean, I know that uh, there's suppositions about why Mars uh, atmosphere has gone away and basically why life might have stopped there. Is that also part of your study? Yeah, so Mars is interesting. It's, it's our next door neighbor planet. And in many respects, it's the most Earth-like place we know about, or at least it used to be. We, we see substantial evidence that used to have rivers and oceans and lakes of liquid water on its surface and a much thicker atmosphere. But it suffered this kind of global catastrophic collapse. The magnetic field failed early on Mars. Its atmosphere has been blown away into space. It's now dried up on the surface to become a kind of a freezing cold desert. So if life did get started on a warmer, wetter Mars, on a primordial Mars, and it's there still today, it's almost certainly extinct, or it's kind of the relics of the life we'd be looking for. So looking for life on Mars isn't looking for green bug-eyed monsters. It's probably not even looking for alive cells. It's looking for fossilized cells or the kind of chemical relics after that. And so that's what our Mars rovers do, that they're basically miniaturized laboratories with some wheels on the bottom and some solar panels on top and a camera or two so we can see where we're going to study in situ Mars to look for interesting organic chemistry. Cool, and uh, before we go to questions from the audience, and we have, uh, you're gonna be giving out the mic, so wave your hand to our lovely volunteer and he will get a mic into your hand uh, as we move forward. Um, I, the, the part of your book that really, I, I listened to your book on the way back from Burning Man uh, last week, so it was kind of this great tour of geology uh, as I crossed the... the, the I just literally California, crossed the geology, Nevada yeah. Nevada and California, um, of kind of where, of w one of the places at least where uh, kind of the, the, the people who crossed the land bridge uh, stopped first, and it was, it was amazing in that right. But um, the, the part where they figured out this thing in the trade winds to turn away from turn away from the safety of land. Um, what I didn't get is, do we have, do we have records of, you know, who was, who was the first jackass who <laughs> did that? I mean, I think they realized that the winds were against them further north yeah. and from the coast, and then, so they had to go find those. But also the kind of Christopher Columbus story of like, how did he know he was gonna get back? So, so Columbus basically cheated. No one was gonna fund Columbus. The Portuguese certainly weren't, because by that point, um, the Portuguese navigators were about to round the tip of South Africa and they thought they had a route into the Spice Islands anyway. So this Genoese navigator kind of, and you can almost certainly imagine Columbus with this kind of like rude boy swagger going, I can get you to the Spice Islands. And he fudged the numbers because if you take the numbers that were known at the time for the size of the earth and the known distance from Europe to India and then China across land, because we had those measurements from, from Silk Roads, there is no way a ship could ever have survived if the ocean was there all the way around. So Columbus was a lucky sod, and there happened to be a continent in the way that he stumbled into to go, ta-da, I told you guys all along. Died without accepting that he'd not discovered a route to India and had found this kind of whole new land. But Columbus cheated by eventually exploiting that Portuguese knowledge of the Volta do Mar. You can't go back where you came from the way you got there. You have to go north or south to reach that kind of opposing band and take your way back across. And there's this really interesting quirk of history that if Columbus had been sponsored by the Portuguese, I'll show you the map because it makes a lot of sense. If, Port if Columbus had been sponsored by the Portuguese, he would have begun his transatlantic crossing attempt. Ah, oh, computers. Um, from not the Canary Islands, but the Azores. The Canary Islands were owned by the Spanish by treaty, the Azores were owned by the Portuguese. And the Azores, uh, we now know, a third of the way across the Atlantic 
towards the America. It would have been the natural place to attempt a crossing of the sea, get as far out as you can. But you'll notice from the wind bands that you would be fighting be the totally winds screwed. the entire way. Say? You'd be totally screwed. You'd, be, you'd be totally screwed. So if the Portuguese had supported him, Columbus would have died deep in the Atlantic because he was putting himself on the wrong wind band. It was through sheer fluke. The Spanish ended up supporting him, therefore he started from the Canary Islands and effectively just allowed himself to be blown down in the whole way until he stumbled into the, the Caribbean. Ooh. And the rest, they say, is, is, is history. It was, it was that quirk. Uh, the, the... But I think with many things, if Columbus hadn't done it, someone would have done it within you know, 10, 20 years. Right. So often things in history kind of have their time. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we can maybe talk about it later, but I'm curious as to, you know, we now know that the Vikings were crossing further north and what their little uh, version of that circle was. I assume they were taking advantage of trade winds up there as well. Yeah, they, well, the, beyond the westerly winds, there's another band of westerly blowing winds right. that the, the Norse were able to go. But during a period of, of Earth's climatic history called the medieval warm, so Greenland was green back then, and they were able to colonize New, Newfoundland simply because the Earth was warmer in that period of, of kind of right. pre, pre-modern history. Cool. All right, do we have our first question? Somebody with a mic? Oh, there we go. I think that was a great talk, and I realize that you have abbreviated it and you have much more detail in the book itself. But what I was curious about is when you talked at the beginning about uh, man in the changing climate of the uh, Rift Valley uh, and his evolving into having a larger brain. That, to me, demonstrates a correlation, but not a cause and effect. And I wonder whether you have more evidence in your book uh, on that point. Um, yes, is the short answer. <laughs> the longer answer is there's something like 600 references in the back of the book that will make your eyes bleed if you wanted to read into, into all the detail uh, behind this. But I, I cede your point in general that correlation does not necessarily mean causation. And you need mechanisms to explain things which you can corroborate with evidence and, and kind of supporting data, but it stands out starkly when you plot on a kind of timeline these periods of extreme climactic instability in the East African Rift Valley from these cosmic cycles, from the Milankovitch cycles, and the emergence points of new hominin species or jumps in cranial capacity in the fossil record or the emergence of new stone technologies. They all cluster very tightly in those distinct periods of climactic and, and instability. These, the Milankovitch cycles, just to review, my understanding is that it's the, the wobble on the Earth's axis, which is about every 26,000 years combined. The, the precession, yeah, precession yeah. of the equinoxes. Um, combined, combined with a couple other things, right? There are three major ones um, to do with the ovalness or circularness of Earth's orbit around the sun, and then the um, precession of the Earth's axis, the precession of the equinoxes, uh, but also the axial tilt, the, the three so main the notion ones. is that they were putting both uh, abundance in the environment every 52,000 years and then uh, kind of um, struggles into the environment on the opposite sides of those cycles? Yeah, exactly. During, and and the, the main one was driven by the precession cycle, which is the shortest one. And um, during periods of instability, and then driven by the precession cycle, getting into a bit too much detail now. Um, but those, that was the times when those amplifier lakes, they're called, were flickering in and out. And importantly, changing the environment on a time course shorter than the lifespan of an individual. Because if it just gets dry around you, you evolve a camel. That, that's happened plenty of places that's easy to evolve a solution to. If your environment is going wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry, you can't evolve your body to survive. You You've got to tool. change. You build a tool, you build a brain right. that can outthink the environment. That, that's the idea behind our intelligence. Because, because our big brains are phenomenally expensive things to support in terms of the amount of food we have to eat to, yeah. to provide them. Indeed. All right. Thank you. Do you have another question? Pass that mic. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the talk. It was a lot of wonderful information. Um, when I saw the diagram, of the wind patterns uh, organized into those bubbles around the globe. I was curious why the uh, chirality reverses at 30 degrees, why it's organized into six distinct sections rather than eight or 10 or two 
Uh, firstly, I salute your usage of chirality. <laughs> I enjoy that immense. Chirality has got, has got a, a lot of usage in astrobiology because it determines whether molecules are light, left handed or right handed. It, it's one of the signatures we look for life is the chirality of molecules. Uh, but to answer your, your question, those Hadley cells are a heat engine, it's a convection cell, just like you get over a radiator, um, where warm air rises and then sinks in, in this vertical cell. Uh, the feral cell, sorry, the um, polar cells, although you're much higher latitudes and it's cooler, there is still enough rising and then sinking again of the air masses to create a circulation current with the same sense, the same chirality as the Hadley cell. And in between the two is the feral cell, which is a passive circulation system. You've got two cogs turning on both sides in the same direction, which then turns the cog in the middle. Oh, so they're driven by the Hadley and the polar. The feral cell is driven by the Hadley cell and the, and the polar cell. So it's passive, but importantly, it turns therefore in the opposite direction, and therefore the winds on the surface it gives you blow in the opposite direction. Otherwise, exploration would have been crap if all the winds blew in the same direction. You would, you would have to circumnavigate the planet each time you wanted to trade across an ocean. It would be rubbish. And the term... The the number of those cells, which is kind of the, the height of the atmosphere and how much heat it, it Planetary going features, into, like the yeah. rotation rate of the Earth, the kind of temperature gradient of the, the atmosphere. So um, Jupiter has got those um, circulation currents incredibly visibly in its atmosphere because they, you can see the bands of kind of orange, red, orange, red. The chemistry of the clouds is different that really highlights those Hadley circulation cells in, in Jupiter's atmosphere and Saturn to a lesser extent uh, because Jupiter rotates so quickly. Gotcha. Yeah, so we see that in the gas giants really well. Yeah. Other questions in the back? Yes. Um, so the diagram showing where um, soil that was older and more nutrient rich was predictive of political outcomes. Are there other areas in the world where you haven't yet seen um, the more pronounced political outcomes where you predict that will happen because of soil? Sorry, are the regions in the world where we predict but haven't seen yeah, so we, we see the political outcome and then, and then we see the, the pattern. You needed the political outcome in order to notice this pattern. Are there other parts of the world where now that we know this about soil and the age of soil and the nutrients of soil, are there parts of the world where we see the, uh, the, the predictive variable where you have the, the nutrient, rich, nutrient rich older soil where we might start to see some emerging political patterns in the future. Sorry, I, I see what you mean. Um, I used this to demonstrate what I thought was a really satisfying chain of cause and effect, like I said, across centuries of our history and then millions of years of planetary history. You, you would be brave to try to make predictions on a single election based on, on geology. We're, we're talking about two very different <laughs> timescales here. Although the point I was making here is that pattern persists from one election to the next. It's not random. There is a deeper cause, a strata of explanation. It's, it's overlaid it. with the fact that you know we had a, 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 a strange feature of labor that happened with slavery in the United States, or in the case of the UK, uh, labor of, of mines that, that drew sure, uh, blue-collar sure. workers. Yeah, yeah. So it, you, you would need that mix of the strange labor infusion on top yeah. of it. Yeah. So I mean, my, my central point, my central argument in Origins is that historians have traditionally focused on cultural explanations, social, historic, um, economic. And those are all, of course, important. You would be a fool to argue that they're not important behind history. But the point I'm making is they are the top level proximate explanations for the course of history in the world we find today. And very sh just beneath that are the deeper levels of explanation of, of the geological, the planetary, the, the atmospheric. And they are all important. But my point is that often the planetary causes have been neglected or ignored in our interpretation and explanations of history, even though they can't always be predictive because they, they change slowly. The other thing that I, that I love about this map is if you plot the emergence, the, the start date of football teams across the UK, they all absolutely cluster onto rocks which are 320 million years old. <laughs> and again, this makes sense. In the Industrial Revolution, you go where the energy is, where the coal fields are. That's where the factories were built. That's where you have that first burst of urbanization um, in the cities. People get bored on the weekends when they're not in the factories. They invent games and kicking around inflated pig bladders. And that's now the Premier League and people diving in, in the box. Um, but, it, but again, it's a slightly more kind of you know, superficial example. But again, there's a very close correlation 
between the kind of planet train and you could imagine that there's something like this in South America around mines and as well as you know, even north, the northwest around forests uh, and, and how the people who have been attracted for that labor may have affected the politics, obviously, of, yeah. of those areas. Exactly. Maybe on, more on a biological level than a geologic level in some cases, like yes. the trees. Yeah. Pl plenty, plenty of similar examples to, yeah. to these. Are there other questions from the audience? There's, there's one around the corner that you might not be able to see. You can grab the front row. Oh. Your mind seems really well trained to like not see causation and only see co correlation. But like, what if it wasn't? What are some really good tempting causal relationships <laughs> that exist in your research that you've just had to tell yourself, okay, correlation isn't causation, but like, what if it were? Uh, so so I, I teach a class at my university on use and abuse of statistics and infographics, which I don't quite understand why becoming so popular because it's basically just a scientist plotting information, but newspapers and websites are now going crazy for infographics, like, oh, it's blowing my mind, we can draw pictures of, of data. And one of my favorite correlations is it's something like um, usage of Internet Explorer 4 and the murder rate. <laughs> and, and, and I can't quite remember it, but it's, it is a correlation, not a causation, which we've talked about already, in that over time, people have stopped using Internet Explorer 4 because Macs are much better anyway, and people use Safari now. Ooh. Um, and the murder rate has also been decreasing over time because we've got better at police forces and, and, and predicting crimes and stuff. There's another cracking one between if you plot um, chocolate consumption per capita, the amount of chocolate that people eat in a country versus number of Nobel Prizes they've won, and there is a dead straight linear relationship. You can do the R squared value, the correlation coefficient is basically exactly one. Stat statisticians would tell you, yeah, that's ironclad. But again, often the correlation is due to two things being determined by an invisible third thing. And in this case, it's clearly um, the wealth of, of the country. People who are in better off countries have more disposable income, and of course you're going to spend it on beer and chocolate. And countries which are better funded have more money to put into research and science and therefore make. But also historically, uh, countries which industrialized early have had that kind of historical base to, to accumulates more Nobel Prizes over time. I'm pretty sure if I had to use IE4, I'd be killing <laughs> You'd be murderous, exactly. Yeah. All right, we have one more qu last question here in the front. I'd like to debate the use of Safari. Um, but um, actually, I've already <laughs> forgotten the name of the, the ocean, which has been Teffies. relegated to a pond. Um, but you, you basically described that the civilizations that bloomed on the northern edge were blooming because of the richness. What describes the outliers in the south, one of which being Egypt? Um, you know, one of the most advanced ancient civilizations. Was it just in a perfectly good spot in an otherwise tough neighborhood? Yeah, kind of that. So I didn't mean to be hating on the Egyptians. I have a, I have a lot of love for them as a civilization as well. They're my top five civilizations of, of, of all history. <laughs> um, and I, I do talk at, at quite a length about the ancient Egyptian civilization in Origins. And I, I mentioned briefly during the talk about how it's this, this slither of civilization, this linear oasis of the Nile. And actually, that proved to be a great advantage in one sense for the Egyptians, because you don't need to waste much money on an army to defend yourself from an invasion, because the environment does that quite effectively for you. People don't march armies across deserts unless they really have to. The British did, yeah. Well, OK, we're going to get, get all colonial about it. But the flip side of that was also you, can't, you don't get much timber to use in a desert. So the Egyptians were never able to build their own navy to spread their influence further afield. They got cedar from basically Lebanon, but that was exceedingly expensive. So they never developed a navy to explore the Mediterranean or come down the Red Sea into the rest of the world. And that's probably why Egypt had no lasting effect in history. No one else adopted hieroglyphics. We didn't adopt the same belief system and religion and culture as Egypt because they kind of kept themselves because they're bottled in by, by the environment, by the desert. And there's, there's, whole other, there's several other facets that meant Egypt was perfectly set up to be a flourishing but limited civilization to do with the direction the wind and the direction the, the Nile flowed, which was very helpful for them. And I talked about Carthage, which sits right on this little nub here. When you say wind, so the, the wind goes against the direction of the Exactly. Of the current so you flow period. downhill in one direction with the Nile and then sail back up again, and you've got a natural transit system, which enabled the Old Kingdom 
uh, to be unified in, in the first Pharaonic dynasties. It, it, was, it was that transport system that enabled them to exert their influence over such a wide area so early in history. So Egypt uh, unified you know, kind of around 3000 BC. It's incredibly early in, in history to build such, a, such a, an empire of a large spatial expanse. Uh, and then Carthage, we talked about, is about the only natural harbour in that entire stretch. And that's why they became so influential through trade and then challenging Rome, which the Romans didn't like so much, so said enough is enough and, and wiped them out, which is a bit mean. Um, yeah, but those are pretty much the only two exceptions um, across the, the southern half of the Mediterranean. Well, I want to thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight. Thank you. And uh, I think... I think this will be your second coin, but all of our it speakers is. get one of our challenge coins. Really Thank you. It.